So I'm going to go ahead and get started with my strawberry talk. I want to kind of keep this as a general strawberry management. Uh, so talking about systems that might be appropriate for, uh, for strawberry production in Utah. And so first of all, why strawberries? Um, strawberries can get good yields. We, you know, a typical field production can be 6,000 pounds the acre in a cold climate environment. Uh, we've had systems that are, exceed 20,000 pounds the acre, and I'll be talking about some of those and, and how you can achieve those kinds of yields. So good yields, um, the price per uh, pound can be range quite a bit based on your market, but uh, pick your own oftentimes is a dollar to $2.50 a pound, uh, and that can be even higher depending on your market, and then there's a, a good market for pre-picked. But, but pick your own is, is a popular thing with strawberries. One of the reasons that a lot of people get into strawberries in a diversified situation is that it's an early season crop and it attracts customers. So if you have a market like shown there on the top, uh, the strawberries are what oftentimes bring people in and get them coming to your market early in the season. And so that's a, certainly one of the reasons that a lot of people get into strawberries. Um, I want to talk about, before I get into production systems and, and management approaches, it's important to understand kind of the, the natural growth cycle of a plant so that we understand how those, uh, those production systems use that or utilize or exploit that, that natural cycle. So this uh, image that I have down here is of a diagram of the yearly cycle of typically June bearing type or short day type strawberries. So here we are in the late winter, things are dormant. They tend to wake up based on temperature. So as the temperatures become favorable for growth, we get um, the emergence of the inflorescence or the flowering structure. Then the then bloom comes along typically in the field in May. And then about 30 days later, those, those flowers are, ripe, are ripening into fruit. So we're cropping in typically in June in, in the Northern hemisphere in cooler climates. Once those plants have kind of wrapped up their, putting their energy into to developing fruit, they shift over to the emergence of stolons uh, or runners, and then they start to produce daughter plants through the summer. And then as the days get short and the temperatures cool off, they shift from runner production to initiating flower buds in those daughter plants that have been formed over the course of the summer. And the, the flower bud initiation happens typically in September, continuing into October. Then as temperatures get cold, those plants go dormant and we, we repeat the cycle. And that's really where we get this, um, why they call June bearers because of, the, of this cycle and the fact that with the June bearing types, most of the production comes on in one big flush and in most parts of North America, that's in June. There's other types available, um, sometimes referred to ever bearing, which tend to respond more to long days. And then the day neutral types, which are technically insensitive to day length, and they just flower and fruit as the temperatures are appropriate. In our climate where it's particularly on the Wasatch front where it gets hot, we don't get a lot of day neutral or even ever bearer production in the middle of the summer because the temperatures are too high. So you typically get a flush of fruit in the cooler part of the spring and then potentially again in the fall. But these are, this is important in understanding the production systems. So the standard oldest management system is called matted row. And it's been around for a long time. When I first started working in strawberries, I was given a, a copy of the 1929 Maryland production guide. And it talked about how they were producing strawberries in 1929. And it, it's matted row. It hasn't changed a lot other than potentially the equipment that you're using to, to achieve your, um, your field management. So what does matted row consist of? Well, it's spring planted typically with cold stored dormant plants that look like this when you get them from the nursery. They're typically dug in the late fall, cold stored, and then sent to you to, to plant in the early spring. Plant them about one to two feet apart in the row with the th rows maybe three to five feet apart, depending on your system. And then um, that first year, your whole objective is to get that mother plant 
to produce as many daughter plants as you can and get those daughter plants well rooted. And so your, your management is all about that. So that involves picking off any flower clusters that emerge from that mother plant and then fertilizing and irrigating to try and to stimulate these daughters forming and, and establishing well before the before the winter comes. So the first year, well, kind of plants, plant spacing, I gave a range there. Typically, um, there's a close row system where you're you're going to let that matted row become about eight inches wide and plant those rows on three foot to three and a half foot centers. And that's really, for matted row, that's really probably the most efficient system. These narrower eight inch area that's where the, the plants occur and then three feet apart. That's not typically possible for a lot of people that don't have a narrow tractor that will work in that kind of a situation. So more often we see the rows being about 18 inches wide on four to five foot centers because that accommodates most people's equipment a little bit better. So those are two different approaches. One thing to remember is that the best production in that system is along the edge of the row. So with a, a narrower row and more rows in your field, you're gonna get more production. And that's why people try and go to this closer spacing when they can. So weed control is a challenge. Typically between row, you're cultivating like shown in the, in the 1929 guide, not, maybe not with a horse anymore, but you're cultivating to, to keep the weeds down, potentially using directed broad spectrum herbicides to keep the weeds from growing between the rows. And then within row, there's gonna be some hand weeding, uh, some selective herbicides. There are selective herbicides that can be used at different times of the year. Oftentimes those are at renovation or dormant and then using pre-emergence to, to control some of the broadleaf weeds. Um, I typically reference the Pacific Northwest Weed Management Handbook when I'm looking at what best approaches are available for strawberries and what's currently registered. Um, so that first year, again, we're going to plant in early spring. We're going to fertilize and irrigate to promote pegging, which is the, the establishment of those daughter plants, um, cultivation and hand weeding, and then uh, usually a fall or winter pre-emergent herbicide, and then mulching with straw for the winter as well as for spring weed protection. Then in the spring, we're going to take that straw mulch, move it back to the row middles, allow those crowns to start pushing their blossoms up. Uh, for a May to June crop. And th that's the first time that planting is going to crop is in that second year. Then I'm going to do summer renovation to, to stimulate new daughter plants and, and establishment for the following year. Um, late fall mulching and herbicides. And I just repeat that cycle for three to five years, depending on my situation. So a little more about renovation. Just after harvest ends, this is typical approaches. Come in and cultivate to narrow those rows up so that it doesn't become a matted field. Uh, mow off the leaves. It, that's just sometimes done here more often in the east where they have a lot of foliar diseases. They'll mow the leaves off to get rid of some of the older diseased leaves. Breaking out the old crowns, going through in those big old mother plants that are now two years old, breaking those out, and making room for, for new daughter plants to form, controlling the weeds fertilizing to stimulate new daughter plants during that summer runnering period. And sometimes they'll throw up soil, you know, to kind of cover and mulch those, those older crowns as well. The advantage is this system, it's a low cost planting system. It works really good in home gardens where you, you're, or small areas where you wanna keep that planting for multiple years. The nursery plants are readily available. Um, it's easy to get plants in the spring if you order in time before the nurseries sell out. It works well in cold climates. The disadvantages are the weed management can, you need to stay ahead of the weeds and particularly the perennial weeds. Uh, the, another disadvantage is the longer you have that planting, the more smaller, the, the smaller the fruit size and the lower the yields in successive plantings. And if you're in there for four, five, six years, you'll get a buildup of soilborne pathogens. So you kind of need to think about rotating that to a new location. Um, it's also slower to harvest. If you're going to, if you're hiring the crew, if you're sending, pick your own folks through, it doesn't matter. But if you're picking it pre-picked, it's slower to harvest because the fruit's not as easily displayed or found in that planting. And so that your harvest crew takes longer to pick a pound of, of berries. Um, 
With this system, with any system, we need to think about frost and freeze protection. As I mentioned before, straw mulch is typically used, um, if, in particularly in areas where you have very, very cold winter conditions where you might have damage to those crowns. Um, but that straw also becomes a mulch for weeds in the, in the row middle later on. So that has a benefit as well. But spring frost protection is really an issue. When we get warm days in, in early spring, the, the flower clusters start to, to push up and, and temperatures even just a few degrees below freezing will cause these black eyes. So this is the receptacle. This is what would have formed the fruit except for it's dead because it's been frozen. And those will freeze even before they open. So spring frost protection is really issue. One of the methods for spring frost protection sounds a little bit counterintuitive, but it's using mulch in the winter. So what growers will do in colder climates is they'll wait until the ground is as cold as it's going to get in the winter and then put the mulch on to keep the ground cold, delay the emergence of those flowers, so hopefully far enough that there's less risk of losing those flowers to a, to a late spring freeze. Um, another approach that's used a lot in the east is using sprinklers. They'll just set solid set sprinklers out there and on a night when it's going to drop below freezing, they'll run the sprinklers all night to keep the, the blossoms from damage because water freezes at 32 degrees. And as long as there's liquid water on the blossom, it's at 32 instead of 28 or 29 where the blossom would be damaged. We don't use that in Utah for a couple of reasons. Number one, most of us don't have enough water availability to make that work. And number two, we're in a dry, arid climate. And when the, the dew point is low and the humidity is really low, that water is evaporating faster than it's freezing on the plant. And evaporating water cools the plant down, freezing water on the surface warms it up. And so we can actually cause damage by trying to use sprinklers in our dry climate. Another approach is row covers, or a reme is, is a trade name, but the, the floating row cover or crop blanket is a, is, works. Tunnels are another one, high tunnels, low tunnels. Um, combinations of high and low tunnels can work really well for protecting those emerging blossoms. So I'm going to talk about all those a little bit more. Shift a little bit now to the systems. This is annual hill system. Those of you that have been to California or Florida, some of the major strawberry growing areas, you've seen this. They're on raised beds with plastic mulch. But the idea of the hill system and why it's called a hill system is we're growing these plants as hills instead of a matted row. We're going to put the mother plant in there and not let that thing run her and so we have discrete hills here of, of individual plants. It was originally developed for warm climates where they, they didn't get really good runnering. You plant them close together. Initially, the system was to plant them close together in the fall with fresh dug nursery plants, shown in the picture there. Any runners that might form would be removed, but we're planting them late enough in the fall that the plant tend to, tends to not runner but just form crowns and, and initiate flower buds. And so the yield depends on the spacing of these plants and the number of branch crowns that we can get in, in individual plants. Um, usually these are kept for one year. So it's often referred to as annual hill production, although sometimes they'll be kept over for a second year. So some of the advantages to this system with that plastic mulch, we get good weed control in the row and that can become uh, uh, very beneficial. Easier to harvest, you can see the fruit are displayed along the edge of the bed as well as around those individual plants. And so harvest becomes uh, uh, much more efficient. The fruit tends to be cleaner if it's up on the plastic. Um, with annual or, or maybe a two-year crop, there's a short rotation. And it works really well in warm climates. The disadvantage is it's more intensive, higher establishment costs. Uh, some pathogens that weren't a problem in matted row become a problem in the system, but there's, there's pathogens in both system. Um, if you're doing this on a large scale, you got to think about plastic disposal. Some areas of the country where there's a lot of this type of production, there's, there's uh, recycling systems for, for disposing and, and reusing that, that plastic. Um, it's not as well suited in cold climates. If I put my plants up on a raised bed with plastic mulch, it's going to force them to emerge earlier in the spring. It's going to warm that soil. They're going to bloom earlier, which makes it more risk of both uh, winter damage. If I get really cold temperatures, that frost will go farther into the ground, causing damage to the roots. 
and also um, more risk of losing your crop to spring frosts. Um, it, there has been adapt, adaptations for colder climates and, and there are two different approaches. One is using June bearers planted in the fall and the other is using day neutrals planted in the spring and trying to get a late summer to fall production. Again, use, utilizing this approach where if I'm planting in the fall with a June bearer, it's late enough I don't get runner production, but I still get crown formation, or I'm gonna plant a, a day neutral here and hopefully get some production during that first year if I can get it established enough. So I'm gonna focus primarily on that fall planted system. And our next speaker is going to be talking more about the spring planted system. And so I'm, I'm not gonna to touch too much on that, but the timing is critical. I wanna get those plants established early enough that I get four to six branch crowns per plant and no runnering. If I plant too early, I get excessive runnering. And if I plant too late, I don't get a big enough plant with big enough crowns. We've tried using this system with both plug plants and dormant bare root plants, cold store dormant plants, and they both can work, but they need to be planted at a little bit different timing. With the, with the plug plants, first of September works really good in Cache Valley. Um, and we have to plant our, our um, dormant plants about a month earlier if we're gonna do that same fall planted system. But again, spring frosts are still a big challenge. And so we've tried different things for spring frost with this system. It's a higher input, higher reward system. And because we're investing more upfront, we typically go to using a high tunnel and or a high tunnel with a low tunnel inside of it to really protect those blossoms because they're gonna, plants are gonna push earlier um, but we can certainly take advantage of that. So tunnels and shifting gears and talking a little about tunnels here for a few minutes. Tunnels are really a man, a temperature management system. And that's what they're all about. And they're not the only tool. We I mentioned low tunnels. I've mentioned floating row covers. In our systems, we've used those in combination. And sometimes we're using all three, a high tunnel with a low tunnel inside of it and a row cover over the plants inside the tunnel to give us the maximum uh, temperature lift. So that's all to keep, keep heat in the, plant, in, the, in the zone of the plants. But we also need to think about temperature management on the other end, looking at ventilation and shading to try and keep the plants from getting too hot. So kind of temperature management here, this is a temperature profile, February 1st and 2nd. This was a number of years ago, but this was here in Cache Valley. The black line is the field temperatures, the blue line is the high tunnel, and the red line is the high tunnel plus low tunnel. You can see outside it was getting down in the mid 20s at night and only getting in the high 30s during the day. But with a high tunnel, we're boosting those daytime temperatures potentially up into the 60s and even low 70s. But at night, we're not getting a big temperature lift with a high tunnel alone. It's still getting down in the mid 20s. If I add that low tunnel, I can keep those nighttime temperatures up in the third plus above freezing range. So what do we, when we're thinking about temperature management, we need to know what kind of temperatures we're managing for. So this is kind of a illustration of how plants respond to temperatures. At cold temperatures, we can get inner injury. As the temperatures warm up, we get to some baseline where growth starts. And then as we increase the temperature, the growth rate increases up to some optimum. And then once we get above the optimum, we're inhibiting growth with heat. And then we might get up to a point where we get heat injury. So what are these, what does this curve look like for strawberries? Um, whoops, sorry, going the wrong direction. And this is, this is a temperature profile that we had. This is uh, outside and this is with a high tunnel in October. And what we were trying to shoot for was we wanna keep the temperatures above 28 or 29 degrees to prevent the emerging flowers and developing fruit from being damaged. The base temperature for strawberries when they really start to grow is about 40 degrees. And then the optimum is about 70 degrees. And you see that during the day with this high tunnel, we kept the temperatures at about 70 degrees. And that wasn't by happenstance. We were ventilating, we were, had the sides open to keep the, the temperature from getting too hot during the middle of the day, but we were able to keep it at optimum for a big part of the day. So this early season production system, again, we're planning September 1st, we're using June bearers, we're using plug plants at that date, and we're managing 
that tunnel in the fall to try and get good plant establishment, trying to keep the temperatures above 40 and in that 70 degree range as much as we can during the fall, letting them go dormant in the spring or in the winter, and then closing up the tunnel and forcing early growth with high tunnels and low tunnels. And what does that look like in terms of yield? When we did an unprotected annual hill system outside in Cache Valley, we didn't get very much yield. Some years it was almost nothing, maybe up to less than a quarter of a pound per plant. When we used high tunnels alone, we were at a pound and a quarter to a pound and three quarters per plant. Uh, and this plant spacing for reference is about 18 to 20,000 plants per acre. So that's some really impressive yields if, with that type of a system. Um, and here's another advantage. So this is kind of looking at our cumulative yields of high tunnel versus low tunnel. Our field production came on that year, last week of May. With our high tunnel alone, we pushed that a month earlier, last week of April. Using a high tunnel plus a low tunnel, we pushed it several weeks earlier just by getting some heat into that soil, getting the plant growing, and then protecting it from frost. The other system that we've worked with is fall production, and I'm not going to talk a lot about this because it kind of overlaps with our next speaker a little bit, but um, we've, we've used a system where we planted in the spring and even in the midsummer, we used day neutrals, and in our situation, the midsummer temperatures are too hot to really get good production with day neutrals, but, well, we use dormant plants with that, but with getting this system established um, and really what we're doing there is is removing the initial flower buds when we first plant and then removing runners until the plants shift gears and start to fruit and then we can push, push production into the fall by by covering these up um, and in this case we used high tunnels and low tunnels and we were able to harvest uh, day neutral strawberries as late as Thanksgiving and even into early December some years. And so um, that's, that's another approach. If we had a cooler summer, we could probably get some midsummer. So in summary, I think strawberries have great uh, potential for profit because of the yields that we can get and the, and the demand for local fruit. There's two approaches. There's kind of this low input matted row. There's this high input annual hill system. Um, if I was going to go to the high input system, I'd go all the way and do tunnels and, and manage my temperature more carefully. But either way, with either system, we need a way to reliably protect against spring frosts in our environment. If we lose a lot of those blossoms, that's our yield potential. And we're just, and it's also those early blossoms are the ones that produce the biggest fruit. So if I lose those, I really inhibit my fruit size. So that's really one of the, the keys. I think tunnels are a good option for either system, but I would really recommend them for that for your annual hill system because of that higher input, higher risk. But if you're going to go to that route, you're managing temperatures. That's one more thing that you can manage, but it's also one more thing that you must manage. So careful temperature management is, is key. Watching the temperatures, ventilating when it gets too warm, closing them up to try and maintain the heat when it's gonna be cold. Some resources here just to close out. Um, <clears throat> we have a number of fact sheets. This high tunnel strawberry production for early spring harvest fact sheet covers what I've talked about there. There's a high tunnel strawberry production for late fall harvest. That's with the, the day neutrals. Um, we've got some reports on, on cultivars for the Air Mountain West. This A lot of this comes from a group in New Mexico and high elevation northern New Mexico looking at field production and what varieties really worked for them. And we've, we've done some additions to that and made it available to Utah growers and adapted it to our situation. And then again, if you're gonna use tunnels, think about temperature management. There's fact sheet on that. With that, I'm gonna stop and answer some questions. And um, uh, there's a survey there of, to get, please fill out the survey and, uh, and um, we'll have more, more information later on with uh, feedback on that as well. So I'm gonna stop sharing and uh, maybe our next speaker can pull up her 
presentation while I'm taking questions. Sheridan's watching the, the questions. Are there questions for me, Sheridan? There are. So um, when you were talking about the matted row system, we got this question coming in. Are daughter plants as productive as the mother plants? What about daughter two, daughter three, daughter four? That's a great question. And I appreciate you answering that. The answer is surprisingly, the first and sometimes the second daughter are actually the most productive plants in that matted row. So think about the mother plant being there as just producing the plants. The, if I can get that daughter plant pegged down well and a couple of branch crowns formed, it's gonna produce the best, the, the, the highest yields and the best quality fruit. And that's why that whole annual hill system, if you think about it, I'm, I'm establishing a whole field of just daughter plants. It's a good, great question. Other questions? I, do I, I probably have time for a few more before yeah. we get into our next talk. There's a few more. So could you give some advice on fertilizing strawberries? So we have uh, in that production guide, in that fact sheet, we have information on yield or on the amount of, of fertilizer that we're going to do. We typically recommend a split application where you're putting some on in with a matted row, we're putting some on late winter, early spring, usually maybe even a late, as late as bloom, and then another application after harvest to really stimulate our um, runner formation. With the, with the, with the uh, annual hill system, I really recommend fertigation because you can just spoon feed a little bit of fertilizer. And we typically start um, our fertigation program where we're just putting on equivalent of maybe a couple of pounds of fertilizer per acre per week and, and putting that through from about uh, flower bud emergence clear through until after harvest. That, that works really well. And, and rates depending on your soil type and then there's more in the fact sheet about that. So good question there. Great, thank you. Um, Shannon wants to know if starting a home garden matted row system, when is the typical time to buy plants and plant them outside in Northern Utah? I would get the plants as early as you can and plant them as early as you can work the soil. If, the, if it's still gonna freeze, it really doesn't matter because that, that plant is gonna wake up as the soil conditions warm. So the earlier, the better. And remember, pick off, it's gonna throw a few flowers that when you first plant it and it starts to grow, you're gonna pick those off. And that first year, you're really gonna push uh, runnering, but the earlier, the better. Okay, last question. Um, do you have any experience with vertical tower growing in hydroponics or aquaponics with strawberries? We ags, we actually do. We've done that. Um, one of the challenges with vertical growing is if, if we're using a June bearer, it's got to go through a dormant cycle before it really is productive. And one of the challenges we had is trying to protect the roots from those vertical systems through the winter to really push that early production. The other problem that we had was in the summer, it's hard to keep the root system from overheating if you've got it up in a small root volume. So you can in intercept more light, but we never got as good a yields in a vertical system as we did in an uh, in-ground system because of the temperature, both cold and hot temperature stress on the root system. Um, so it, it can work, but you've got to do really good, careful temperature control, environmental control to make it super productive. 